in this clip we're going to talk about the structure, representations and properties of vector autoregressive processes. So let's remember we knew we already know univariate AR processes. So not vector AR but univariate AR processes. Let's state one here just to remind ourselves. Let's say a P ARP process that is yt is a function of yt minus 1 all the way up to yt minus p. Now if you have a multivariate vector autoregressive process that will look very similar just that we will call the coefficients to the lags um, capital phi's and behind the yt's and lags we really have vectors so yt is really a vector k by one vector so it's the constant now this coefficient is k by k and here we have k by k coefficients again the y t lags are k by one and the error is k by one together these terms are k by one as well so everything is k by one in the end and we just have additions of k by one in the univariate case we determined that the residuals were white noise now in a VAR case we are having vector white noise because epsilon t is now k by one vector now the conditions here are that the expected value of that vector is equal to zero that's k by one then the expected value of epsilon t epsilon t prime this is a k by k matrix should be equal to sigma this is something like the variance covariance matrix of the error terms and that the expected value of epsilon t epsilon s prime is zero these are epsilons at different time periods they shouldn't be correlated all of these are independent of t the naught the sigma and the naught again they are valid for all t so these are the characteristics of a vector white noise process it's very important to understand these and we should acknowledge that the error terms can indeed be correlated across different equations so the sigma can have non-zero of diagonal terms but the error terms should not be correlated across time that's why we have that zero for the cross autocovariances so we are building a var p process for the k elements of yt because we think they may be related to each other also through time and the contemporaneous relationship will come only through the variance covariance of the error terms the sigma but lagged relationships will come through this green bit here that's the conditional expectation part of our var p process okay so what we have done before here that, that was all the red text is we discussed the properties of the vector white noise so now we're going to discuss the properties of the yt the expected value of yt we label that mu t then the expected value of yt mean corrected so yt minus mu and then yt minus mu prime we call that gamma naught t and the expected value of the same term but yt and ys gamma st that's again the covariance that's the gamma naught and then auto covariance is the gamma s now if the var process is a stationary one then the t subscripts to all these characteristics will disappear okay and again we have first and second moments which is what we have here constant free time okay that was again our definition of covariance stationarity now that contemporaneous relationship between the yt's that will be purely described as we discussed before by the variance covariance matrix of the error terms uh, we discussed that before that lag relationship this is now going to be some sort of function of the of the capital phi coefficient matrices phi 1 to phi p and that can be quite complicated depends on what sort of rp you have what order p you have and i'm not going to discuss about this right here anymore so here's our var p process it it will turn out that it will be extremely useful to represent this with lag operators we've done that for univariate processes as well so we basically just replace the yt minus 1 by l yt and the yt minus p by l to the p times yt okay, so that's just the application of the lag operator and we should really recognize that here in front of the yt on the left hand side we have an identity matrix which 
if we had a two-dimensional process which just looked like this. Now we can now bring all the terms in yt to the left hand side and then factor out the yt and what we get is this uh, term in parentheses and on the right hand side we'll just get alpha plus epsilon t. Now this entire term here this is now going to be our lag polynomial phi l times yt equals to alpha plus epsilon t. So all that term in parentheses we're just going to label that phi l. Now in the univariate case you have learned that you can represent an ARP as an MA infinity and we will be able to do exactly the same in the vector process and we will also be able to represent it as a Varma uh, process with certain lags, so p asterisk and q lags. We use the VAR for forecasting. The VMA that is going to be used for impulse response functions and the VAMA is very useful to derive stationarity conditions. So all three forms have very uh, specific uses here. So let's first try to establish the stationarity of the process. And to achieve that, we will transform the model into one where we can actually use the stationarity conditions which we learned for univariate processes. So somehow we're going to transform that VARP suitably. The first step we're going to do is that we will divide both sides of the equation with the inverse of the lag polynomial phi l. Now remember that is k by k. So what we get is yt on the left hand side, the inverse of the lag polynomial times alpha plus epsilon t. Now we need to remind ourselves about the fact about the inverse of a matrix. Turns out that the inverse is the same as 1 over the determinant times the adjoint of the matrix. Now what that is you either remember or you'll see at the example we'll use very soon. So let's use that information. So we have 1 over the determinant times the adjoint of the lag polynomial times alpha plus epsilon t. And what we're now going to do is we're going to recognize that this determinant is really a scalar. The adjoint is still a k by k matrix. And we will now multiply both sides of the equation with the determinant of the lag polynomial phi, t, phi l. Okay, so we'll multiply with the determinant. So we get the determinant on the left hand side. That didn't look very nice. So let's do that again. The determinant y t equals the adjoint of the lag polynomial times alpha plus epsilon. This is what we call the Varma representation. We have a lag on the left hand side for the yt's and lags for the epsilons. To see why this actually simplifies things, we shall use an example of dimension 2. So two elements in y, y1 and y2. And on the right hand side, th this is basically a made up example. We have two constants, then there will be lags of y1, y1 t minus 1 and y2 t minus 1 and error terms, epsilon 1 t, epsilon 2 t, that will be a var 1, but what is still missing is this coefficient matrix, this is a k by k, here 2 by 2, and I'll just set some values, 0 0.7, 0 0.2 on the diagonal and on the off di diagonal negative 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. So remember in the front we could write an identity matrix without changing anything. And now we will bring the right hand side lags of y1 and y2 t on the left hand side. We are having this coefficient matrix times l and then times y t. And on the right hand side still the constant on the error term. So let's formulate that lag polynomial, we'll just calculate the identity matrix minus, um, so yeah, it's just positive 0 0.2 here, so we'll just calculate the identity matrix minus that matrix times L, that's what we get, and on the right hand side again the constant and the error vector. Now our lag polynomial is that term on the left hand side, that parenthesis term, the right hand side remains unchanged. And now as before the example we realize that we can with a bit of algebra term that 
turn that into the determinant of the Lag polynomial times yt is equal to the adjoint of the Lag polynomial times the constant plus the error vector. So let's see what the determinant and the adjoint are in our example. So the determinant of the polynomial is the product of the two diagonals minus the product of the two off diagonals. That's 0.04 L squared. The adjoint is the following. We interchange the diagonal elements. So we interchange these two elements, 1 over 0.2. 1 minus 0.2L and 1 minus 0.7L and we leave the off diagonal elements but change the sign. Let's also let's return to the determinant. We'll just calculate what that is. We get 1 minus 0.9L plus 0.1L squared. You of course can check that yourself and then we use that in our VAMA representation so that lag times yt vector, then we have the adjoint times the constant plus the error term. So recognize that this guy here is a scalar and that means what we get here on the left hand side is two univariate AR processes, i.e. basically two lines which only involve y1 or y2 and their lags but are not mixed. So therefore, we can now use our, our univariate stationarity conditions. And in the univariate case, we knew that if the AR part is stationary, then the entire armor process is stationary. And that is valid here as well. So now the question remains, how do, do we determine if the AR part is stationary? We need to look at the roots of the characteristic polynomial. They ought to be inside the unit circle. And what we are looking at is this guy up here. That was our lag polynomial. So what we do is we replace the L's with the lambdas, but with inverse powers. So back here we have lambda to the naught. We can leave that away and we set that to zero. That's our characteristic equation. We solve that and if you do that, you get solutions for lambda of 0 0.7702 and 0 0.1298. Therefore, indeed, we have stationary, a stationary process. So let's recap what we did here. We wanted to obtain the VAMA representation so that we could derive the stationarity condition. We started from the ARP divided by the inverse of the polynomial, eventually brought the determinant over to the left hand side, got our VAMA representation. Uh, we decided we needed to decide whether the univariate armor processes are stationary. We uh, realized what we needed was the determinant of the lag polynomial that was a scalar, so therefore we got these univariate processes. And then we just had to use the same criterion as we always did for univariate processes, and we got an answer. Now that we've established the stationarity conditions, we can consider the move from a var p to a uh, vector m a infinity presentation. So here we start out with our var p and what we do is we pre-multiply with the inverse of the lag polynomial. So this is what we get and this guy remember that's a k by k matrix and for this to be invertible it needs to be non-singular and that's the case if the determinant of that lag polynomial is unequal to zero. So we just split up the uh, constant and the arrow vector. Now this first part, the inverse of the lag polynomial times alpha, we call that mu and recall that mu was nothing else but the expected value of our process then plus that last bit. Now that's a bit more complicated, but just as in the univariate case, it turns out that this will be an infinite sum. So it will be a, a sum from s to zero equals zero to infinity. And what do we sum up? Epsilon t minus s times a coefficient matrix theta s. Now theta naught, that is just the identity matrix. And any other theta s is some sort of complicated function of the phi 1s to phi p's. 
this vector ma infinity representation is used for impulse response functions, but these are not discussed in this clip.